Wonderful. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And thank you all for being here. Before I start, I want to remind us why we can't all be in the same room. And this is obviously because of COVID-19. And I want to urge you to please participate in what we think is the worldwide largest study, international study, on the physical and mental health effects of the pandemic across the whole globe. It's the COFIT study, www.cofit, C-O-H-F-I-T, with or without the hyphen, .com, www.cofit.com. The Collaborative Outcome Study on Health and Functioning During Infection Times, 230 investigators, 155 countries, 159,000 people have participated, but very few from Egypt. So we'll talk about the numbers in Egypt at the end, but please send that link to friends, families, and colleagues. Take the survey yourself, and also have your children participate. Sign on and hand it over to them after answering some questions. But now we want to talk about another impact of an illness on life, and that is psychosis and schizophrenia when it hits early on. This is my disclosure information. I'm fortunate to work with a number of companies that are still interested in the brain, that still work on getting new medications into our hands so that we can help patients better. Today's program is co-sponsored by Janssen, but you should feel comfortable discussing anything and everything that's on your mind, and we should have at least 10 minutes at the end so that you can fire questions at me. What do I want to cover with you? First, what are the characteristics of early onset psychosis compared to maybe later adulthood onset psychosis? How do we treat it? What's the efficacy? What's the tolerability? And what should we conclude? Let's start with the characteristics. First, I want to show you data from our large meta-analysis published a few months ago online, where we looked at 197 studies assessing the percent of patients that are diagnosed with mental illness prior to age 14, 18, and 25. And on the left-hand corner at the bottom, you see that our mental disorders hit early. By age 14, one out of three people with mental illness already have it. By age 18, half. And by age 25, two-thirds. In terms of schizophrenia, schizophrenia is less common before puberty. So by the age of end of 13, only 2% of people with schizophrenia as adults have the full their diagnosis. By age 18, it is 8%, basically every uh, 12th or 13th person. But by the age of 25, it is half. So this is an adolescent, early adult onset disorder. But there are diagnostic difficulties, particularly when the disorder hits for the first time, because it hits at a time when other diagnoses also emerge. As I just said, that overall 50% of the mental disorders have declared themselves by age 18. So there can be different disorders that have similarities with psychosis and can be mistaken so that they are not getting to the correct diagnosis of psychosis. For example, emerging personality disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, mood disorder with psychosis, or also developmental delay. But there's also a problem with substance use that starts to emerge in adolescence and can lead to psychosis, even to longer lasting psychosis. This is from a meta-analysis from last year showing that when patients develop psychotic symptoms during the use of a substance, the likelihood and risk of that psychosis to become chronic is the highest when it happens during marijuana use. One out of three people, one out of three people who have psychotic symptoms when using marijuana will have a chronic psychotic illness. 
It is only one out of four to one out of five when we talk about amphetamines, methamphetamine, or mixed or hallucinogens. The downers are much less likely to cause chronic psychosis. So opioids, sedatives, and alcohol, 9 to 12%. So when somebody has attenuated positive symptoms, quasi-psychotic symptoms or family history, they should stay away from marijuana as much as possible. When the illness hits early, it has a poorer outcome, particularly when it's not general psychosis or mood disorder with psychosis, but when it is schizophrenia. In the upper pane, you can see early onset schizophrenia with a poor outcome that is a GAF score of less than 550, 60% of patients, 6 out of 10, have a poor outcome. When we allow other diagnoses in, it's 5 out of 10. But also the proportion of males plays a role. If you have early onset schizophrenia and less than 50% male, 50% have a poor outcome. But if more than 50% are male, it's 63%. And in mixed psychoses, with less than 50% male, it's 40%, and it's 56% with more than males. So, full schizophrenia diagnosis and more males in the early onset disorder means worse outcome. What's the phenomenology? Some people might believe that the brain of a 15 or 17 year old is different in a way that it also manifests psychosis differently. That maybe is not the case. It's not like everybody just has visual hallucinations. No, the most common hallucinations are auditory, 82%. Yes, there is also more visual and olfactory, like 50%, maybe a little bit more than in adults. But the main stay is auditory hallucinations. Delusions, 78%, and especially persecutory. But also thought disorder, two out of three patients, and primary negative symptoms. At the beginning of treatment, 50%. Although it can be hard to differentiate that, as you very well know from your clinical care, from depression and social anxiety. So we may want to treat, particularly in the early phases when we don't have the full diagnosis, we may want to treat with an antidepressant that also increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor and can potentially prevent psychosis. When comparing the characteristics of childhood onset and adulthood onset schizophrenia in the same studies using the same exact methodology, there is a surprising finding. The duration of untreated psychosis that is not good for the brain is three times longer, not shorter. It's three times longer in children and adolescents than it is in adults. Even though we have parents around them, we have teachers, we should see that there's abnormal development. But there are other symptoms, there are other disorders happening at the same time. There's adolescents with social withdrawal that makes it maybe harder to make the diagnosis, but there may also be lack of experience and the fear of giving the diagnosis. On the flip side, comorbid substance use starts to emerge more during early adulthood. So in mostly older adolescents with an age of 16 years, half of them have comorbid substance abuse. But in adults, when the age is 24 years, then two thirds have it. But functionally, both are quite impaired. So, we must identify patients early because we know from this meta-analysis that the effect of antipsychotics is worse when patients have a longer illness duration. So here we have factors that are associated with better outcome. So female sex, higher acuity and severity at baseline gives more room for improvement, but higher mean age and shorter illness duration. When we have someone in the early phase, we want to treat them with something that works, but is also tolerable, because the effect is strongest early on. So the pooled response is 
of at least 20% reduction in first episode schizophrenia, and that's a few adolescents, mostly young adults, is 81%. If you want much or very much improved, that is a 50% reduction from baseline, it is still 52%. Now contrast that against chronic schizophrenia. At least 20% minimally improved, it drops from 81 to 51% when patients are allowed to have multiple relapses. And if you want much or very much improved, it drops from one in two to one in four to one out of five patients. So we need to get people into care early and we need to prevent relapses. That is key. That is what we can do to alter this very difficult to treat disease where the genes and other things within the brain are outside of our reach but early recognition and relapse prevention are inside of our reach. What are predictors of poor outcome? Well, something bad predicts something bad. So if we have more positive symptoms, more negative symptoms, more pre-morbid adjustment problems, that predicts multiple other outcomes. But we can't do much about this because that's how patients come to us. What we can do something about is the duration of untreated psychosis, getting people into care early. This is a recent meta-analysis showing that at baseline, before treatment, there were four symptoms where patients were worse off compared to people who had shorter DOP. Negative symptoms, quality of life, global cognition, and deliberate self-harm were worse in those that had longer DUP. But then after treatment, nine outcomes were worse when the brain had more bad effects of the psychosis. Negative symptoms, positive symptoms, global symptoms, overall functioning, social functioning, vocational functioning, less reduction in positive symptoms and total symptoms, quality of life problems, global cognition, and less remission. So getting people identified early and treating them with antipsychotics early is key. In terms of predictors of poor outcome, here you see multiple studies that have different predictors here in the small print. But whenever you see a dark line, this is when every study showed that as a predictor. And younger age of onset was the main figure and factor that cut across almost all studies as a poor outcome predictor. But how should we treat? Well, first of all, you know that I know that you know that medication is the backbone of treatment but it shouldn't be the only component. We must pair medication with psychoeducation. We must pair it with individual, group, and family psychotherapeutic interventions so that we can get the patient back into life. We also should not only focus on efficacy as the spearhead. We must consider tolerability and adherence. Because without those three, we will not get to higher order outcomes of subjective well-being, quality of life, and functioning. There are non-pharmacologic general treatment options, same in adolescents or adults, psychoeducation, stress management, sleep hygiene, staying away from drugs, support groups, psychotherapy, but also early in the illness score, supported employment and education. We want to get people back into their social and educational or vocational engagement. We might want to address compliance issues and also have measurement-based care, symptom charting, side effect charting. What is the efficacy that we have in terms of medications, antipsychotics approved for use below age 18 in the United States based on a randomized controlled placebo controlled trial 
approval for aripiprazole, lurazidone, olanzapine, paliperidone, quetiapine, and risperidone. In Europe, the first-line agents that are approved are aripiprazole and paliperidone, but only as of age 15. And the only drug in Europe that is approved also for age 13 and above is lorazidone. And then clozapine was grandfathered in for treatment-resistant schizophrenia. What will the data look like for acute efficacy? Here you see the multiple studies that were conducted against placebo in gray. Almost all doses of all medications separated from placebo with differences in the symptom reduction on drug or placebo. There were two notable studies that were not positive, and they made the mistake to assume that small people need small doses. We do not use weight-based adjusted dosing in younger people, nor in adults. So, asenapine was given at 5 or 10 milligrams instead of 10 or 20. 10 milligrams would have separated, but the statistical plan pulled the two together. Suprazidone was given as weight-based dosing, like polyperidone, lower weight got lower doses. Doesn't work. Not for Zeprazidone and not for some doses with polyperidone. I dose until I see either wow or ow. So I go up, start low, go slow, but go until you see either efficacy or you need to go down a little when you hit tolerability issues. Interestingly, treatment by EVE patients do better than previously treated patients. There's only one study in the world literature that actually has a placebo-controlled trial in antipsychotic naive patients, and that is this study here. And what we can see is that the effect size is almost double. So the earlier you treat, the better the effect. Head-to-head -head studies are few and far between. Small samples, small differences, except for clozapine. Well, clozapine is better than haloperidol, regular dose olanzapine, and even high dose olanzapine up to 30 milligrams in our study in the New York State Hospital system. So for refractory illness, yes, clozapine beats other agents, but otherwise you would choose the treatment based on efficacy and tolerability considerations. There were two larger head-to-head -head studies. One compared polyperidone with our piprazole in adolescents with schizophrenia. The polyperidone mean dose was seven milligrams and the our piprazole mean dose was 12 milligrams. The modal doses were six and 15. No difference in any of the symptoms but difference in side effects. And then we conducted this study in Denmark, comparing our piprazole against quetiapine extended release. And again, in symptoms, didn't find a difference, but in side effects, we did. Putting this into a network meta-analysis, we showed that, again, except for what we knew already, a senapine and zeprazidone, the other agents were better than placebo. So the green dots are from the network meta-analysis that we conducted in adolescent schizophrenia. In blue, I put in the dots of the adult network meta-analysis by Stefan Leucht. And you can see that most of the dots are very close together meaning we don't have a developmental underperformance of antipsychotics in adolescents. There are two agents that seem to have a larger effect size in kids than in adults, olanzapine and quetiapine, but this may be due to more sedation, which is counted for the total pants. So if you want sedation with one of the non-sedating agents, by all means use a benzodiazepine, use a typical antipsychotic that's sedating low potency for a week or so and then take it away. And lorazidone also had a higher effect size because there were more antipsychotic naive patients. 
But as mentioned, we shouldn't only treat with medication, we should do integrated care. This is a meta-analysis of 10 studies and 2,176 patients, where we looked at 15 meta-analyzable outcomes and found that when adding to the antipsychotic, coordinated specialty care, that is, psychosocial interventions, individual and group therapy, supported employment and education, family interventions. When you put all of this together and coordinate the care, rather than disintegrated usual care, there was significant advantage in the combination. But the acute illness phase is only the beginning. We must prevent relapses to keep people's brains and lives intact. When looking at modifiable risk factors for poor outcome in adults that start after a first episode, we see, as discussed, a longer duration of untreated psychosis is not good. Addiction as poor morbidity is not good. Something happens in the brain. And adherence also is down. We also did a meta-analysis showing that when in the first two weeks of treatment, and you're giving a really good dose, and the patient is taking it, when you don't see anything, not even a little bit of improvement, most likely this medication and this patient is not going to work well. But the most identifiable and the most addressable factor for relapse prevention is to reduce the number of relapses by identifying or reducing the chance of non-adherence. Relapse is our main enemy. That is true for all chronic disorders, but particularly for schizophrenia. Multiple relapses, multiple exacerbations are associated with more long-term symptoms and disability. A higher risk of suicide attempts Progressive brain structure loss, the gray matter shrinks with duration of psychosis after treatment starts. We also know that after each relapse, one in six to one in seven patients is now not as responsive anymore. It's like secondary treatment resistance that we are breeding by allowing people to relapse. And then there's obviously greater use of healthcare services, burden to patients, families, and healthcare systems. But whenever you have someone with a first episode, be it an adolescent or a young adult, the next question that comes from the patient or the family is, how long do I have to take this? What's the best answer? Well, the best answer actually is not one year or six months or two years, whatever you believe. The best answer is to say, I don't know. And then people will say, what, are you kidding me? You are the expert. How should you not know? Well, you're right. But I need more information. So let's see how you're doing on the medication. If you're stabilized on it, then we can talk again. Otherwise, we need to find the right medication. Okay, now I'm stable. Can I, can I stop? Well, you've been stable for four months, but we know from research that the longer your brain is stable, the better your outcome. The less likely you will be admitted against your will again into a hospital. Okay, now I'm a year stable. Can I stop? Well, a year is pretty good, but you're now doing education. Don't you want to finish your training? Okay, now I've finished my training. Can I please stop my medication? You're just starting your first job. It would be so risky to stop. You've gotten so far right now. Okay, I've had my first job. Can I now stop? You have a girlfriend. Don't you want to have a family? So what I'm just doing and fast forward is motivational interviewing. Meaning I knew already the patient wanted to be in training. They wanted to not go to the hospital again. They want a job. They might want to have a family. I need to ask them that, obviously. But when I have that information, I link that goal to stability. Because 
we don't have many randomized trials to determine when you could stop, but we have this study in front of you, which is a nationwide database study. So 100% of all patients in Finland are inside of this study, followed for up to 20 years, fully generalizable sample. And what the authors did, Yari Tion and his team, they put as relapse risk one as a comparator for those patients that picked up the medication from the pharmacy. So we don't know whether they swallowed, but at least they had it in their hand. And then those patients who don't pick up the prescription and are non-adherent, they have a 100% increased relapse. But then let's look what happens when you treat for five, six, nine, ten months and then stop. The risk of relapse is not reduced, it's the same. What if you treat for a year to two years and then stop? The risk doesn't go down. What happens when you treat for two to five years and then stop? Actually, the risk doesn't stay the same or go down. It goes up from double to threefold. And when you or the patient stops after more than five years, it goes up to sevenfold. Why? Why is the security going down and not up? Well, because this is not a randomized trial. Who do we keep on medication the longest? Those are the people who have residual symptoms, who are not functioning well, who have poor illness insight, who are very sick before they got the medication. And those are at highest risk of relapse. The question has arisen whether during the maintenance treatment we should reduce doses. And the answer is no, don't do it unless the acute treatment overshot and you have doses that are too high that lead to side effects. But if you don't have rate limiting side effects, this meta-analysis that we just published a couple of months ago indicates that when you reduce the dose up to 50%, the relapse risk is up by 44%. And when you do this in terms of very low dose, the relapse risk goes up by 72%. So we need to be very careful in not having patients reduce the dose unless it's really necessary. And we need to harvest the good outcomes when people stay on medication. So these are lurazidone data, open label, two-year data showing that stability having no more than mild positive and mild negative symptoms that's called remission was achievable in two out of three patients when patients took the medication but relapse prevention can only be proven against placebo and this is a study where this was done patients stabilized on our propozole and then either bloody blindly continued on our purposeol in blue or going to placebo in yellow. And yes, there was a higher relapse rate when stopping treatment. But very interestingly, the clinicians were allowed to find the right dose and keep the dose they wanted. What you can see is in the prevention of relapse, overall the number needed to treat was seven. After each seventh patient, Continuation with the antipsychotic led to one less relapse. But if you only dose 10 to 15 milligrams, then the risk reduction was one out of nine patients. But if you have an NNT of four, then it takes actually one out of four patients. You are in the game of relapse prevention. So the, the number is the best at the higher dose here because patients might need this dose. So don't underdose even adolescents, find the right dose for your patient. But then the question is, if we assume that patients are non-adherent a lot, wouldn't a long-acting injectable be the next right thing? Well, in the past, long-acting injectables were reserved for multiple episode patients, those that had already declared themselves as non-adherent. 
or those that wished to have a treatment. But many patients don't know about it. So here are again Finnish data nationwide and they could show that patients who were admitted for the first time in their life for schizophrenia when they were discharged on a long-acting injectable and only 5% were discharged on a long-acting injectable although 50% were non-adherent a month after discharge 50% a month after discharge 5% got an LAI but when they got an LAI, and these are most likely the ones that are sicker, that have already been non-adherent in the past, that poor illness inside, might actually have poor social network. Still, despite that disadvantage in this naturalistic study, those that were discharged on an LAI had a 59% lower risk of all-cause discontinuation and a two-third reduction of relapse. That's a very big reduction just based on using a different formulation and this is the largest meta-analysis that's now out that we just published in may putting together our three individual meta-analyses into one with all three designs and while before in the randomized controlled trials the oral and the lai medications were similar long-acting injectables were not better in 2014 in our meta-analysis than oral treatments. Why? Because people in these trials knew they were checked, they were adherent, they were also not as sick. But now we have more first episode in early phase studies and boom, looking at 397,000 patients in these three designs, we were able to show that long-acting injectables were better than oral treatments for hospitalization and relapse in all three designs, mirror image, cohort, and RCTs. And that's a very strong endorsement. Out of the over 300 outcomes, one out of five favored the long-acting injectable, and only five out of 100 favored the old treatment, and that was mostly side effects that were biased because one medication was the LAI, and then many others could be chosen to optimize tolerability in the oral arm. And that was done in this study, for example. Polyperidone once monthly in early phase patients within the first five years of illness versus clinician's choice, oral antipsychotic. And you can see that there was, despite the disadvantage of the LAI, that only one could be chosen there was a significant reduction, 33%, in the long-acting injectable arm versus oral choice. But I like this treatment trial the best because it compares apples to apples. The same medication given either orally or as an LAI. Risperidone, biweekly injected or oral. These are randomized patients, first episode. And what happens after a year? one out of three patients relapses in the oral group versus five out of a hundred. Well, if you had a cousin, an uncle, an aunt, a father, a brother who has schizophrenia, do you want one out of three relapses or five out of a hundred? But then you look at the graph and say, Professor Correll doesn't know his slides. The graph ends at 0.5, that is 50%. What is he talking about 33%? That would be here. You're right, entirely right. 33% were observed. These were the patients still in the study. But when you do a Kaplan-Meier survival curve, counting that everybody would have made it to the end of the year, actually 50% relapsed. Why is there such a big difference? Because excellent adherence was only present in 33% of the oral treated patients. So this will go up to 70% of relapse minimum. Whereas it was only a 5% non-excellent adherence in the LAI arm. Now why are these patients suddenly saying, yes, I'm sick, I want the medication, here I am. They don't do that, but we know when they stop. That's the beauty of an LAI. Everybody knows and we can do something about it. But look at this graph. 
8% versus 50%. That's a 42% absolute risk reduction. It's a 600% relative risk reduction. 8 times 6 is 48%. If this were cancer, if this were cardiovascular illness, this medication would be taken off the market, being medical malpractice, because so many more patients have such worse outcomes. And the relapse is a bright outcome, both in the moment, but also for the overall illness trajectory. But the beauty of LAIs, of long-acting injectable treatments, is also that even when they are stopped, they linger on, they work in the brain. So here we have three placebo arms from placebo-controlled discontinuation studies. And you can see in the darkest line after start stopping oral polyperidone, 60 days later, 50% were taken out because they worsened. When you come from the one, three month, from the one monthly, it takes actually almost seven months. And when you come from three monthly, it takes 13 months. You may have heard that basically a week ago, the six monthly polyperidone was just approved because it had similar, very favorable relapse prevention data as the once monthly, and sorry, and, and the three monthly. But there is something else. We looked at this recently, trying to find out when medication is stopped, is the relapse rate different? And it is. When people come from an oral treatment in red, or when they come from an LAI, the protection lasts longer, even though the medication is stopped. Now, there are five half-lives, though, that the medication is in the system. So this is the hazard ratio of three and a half. But when we truncate this and only follow people after five half-lives have, have ceased, both at, at the oral or the long-acting injectable, the hazard ratio of protection goes even up. So we have medications that work when they're in the system, and even when patients stop, we have more protection, and we can use that protection to get people back on track. But we only focused at the moment on symptoms and on relapse, but we want functionality. And this is a study in the first episode patients where actually the long-acting injectable was given for the first two years. And with that, recovery went up to 44%, symptomatic and functional recovery. In the Yaskelein meta-analysis, it was 13.5% overall and 16.6% for first episode patients. So this is basically two and a half fold better outcome because we can have assured stability with the long-acting injectable. But we also know from multiple studies, whether it's lithium, clozapine, or long-acting injectables, the later you start, the worse the outcome. The earlier you start, the better the outcome. So here, people are on either one monthly uh, polyperidone within the th first three years of illness or later. And the ones that got it earlier have both better symptom control, but also better functioning. And the same is true here. When looking at the PSP, the Personal and Social Performance Scale, those that got it earlier have better outcome than those that got it later. And this is everybody is getting polyperidone one monthly or three monthly. Let's finish up with tolerability. In kids, there is a higher likelihood of sedation, withdrawal dyskinesia, prolactin side effects, and weight gain than in adults. Parkinsonism, we just showed in a study most likely with second generation agents when titrated well, there isn't a higher risk. What about long term side effects? Tata dyskinesia, diabetes seems lower in younger people because they have had less time on the medication, and age is another risk factor. But relative to the general population, the risk is higher. Only the absolute risk is decreased. Comparing different antipsychotics against each other, including here as a benchmark lorazodone, there was no difference in EPS or akathisia rates among agents 
with the exception that placebo had lower risk of that. Proactin elevation, kids seem to be somewhat more sensitive, but we need to do this in a dose-dependent fashion. And lower doses basically give you less prolactin elevation, as do long-acting injectables, because they have less peak drop variation. But weight gain is one of the most feared side effects, the cardiometabolic risk. And here we have more weight gain with olanzapine than with other agents, and we need to monitor and manage this. In this antipsychotic naive study, you see that there is no weight neutral antipsychotic. Yes, olanzapine caused by far the most weight gain, naturalistic forearm study with a control group of people prescribed an antipsychotic but not taking it, blood level of zero. And we have eight and a half kilograms over 12 weeks with olanzapine, antipsychotic naive youngsters, five to six kilograms with risperidone and quetiapine, but still four and a half kilograms with our piprazole. But there was a, a disconnect between weight and metabolics. Olanzapine works in all metabolic parameters at just 12 weeks. Everything. Quetiapine, all lipids, not yet the glucose parameters. But risperidone, only one single parameter and with a small effect size, triglycerides, was the largest sample. And our PIP results seem to have no significant increase, despite four and a half kilograms of weight gain. Another feared side effect is diabetes. And we were able to show in a meta-analysis that the risk of diabetes is one and a half, 1.8 to twofold higher in people who have antipsychotics versus psychiatrically ill patients of antipsychotics. And we need to monitor and manage that also. The one medication that stood out was again olanzapine as having an individual risk. But side effects are not just physical nuisances. There's a meta-analysis we published earlier this year showing that metabolic syndrome Diabetes and hypertension worsens cognition. Cognition that is already difficult to treat in the mentally ill. So try to choose medications that cause less weight gain. And here we have pediatric data again. You see in the gray bar the percent of, of side effects that there were. This is up to 78 side effects of antipsychotics. And in black, you see how many of these side effects were significantly worse than placebo. And it looked like that, for example, lorazidone, polyperidone, and quetiapine were quite safe. But the biggest side effect of life is death. And here we have the pre prevention of all-cause mortality depending on whether someone takes an antipsychotic and what antipsychotic they take. So the bottom line is patients not picking up medication from the pharmacy. They die the fastest. First generation antipsychotics in the middle, but the best second, but then also long-acting injectable second generation antipsychotics because patients are on it more than offered. So let me conclude to give us time for discussion. You know it from your daily routine and care. Schizophrenia is a severe disorder that often has a debilitating course. It requires timely and effective treatment and diagnosis. Efficacy differences among non-clozapine antipsychotics seem to be individually, but overall relatively small. Clozapine is an exception. And we need to tailor our treatments to the needs of the patient, side effect, adherence, life goals and quality of life and well-being functionality need to be targeted more in future research. We have pediatric patients that are at higher risk of prolactin, sedation, weight gain, and metabolic effects. And we need to take that into account and choose carefully and wisely having the right benefit to risk ratio. 
future drug development needs to pay attention to what happens in the brain of developing brains, but we know that the illness has a 100% side effect on the brains and lives of people because 100% of them have it. With a medication, we can still adjust when something happens. So I thank you for your attention and want to draw again your attention to the COVID study, www.cofid.com, 159,000 people from 155 countries, 340 adults only from Egypt. Please participate, send it on. We also need children or adolescents to help us help others. Thank you very much for your attention.